what's interesting um, to, to meet the new challenges of power delivery to high-speed digital loads with you know the power rails dropping uh, to lower and lower voltages and the currents continuing to increase. Uh, I was talking with Steve, Steve Sandler earlier today and we we're talking about customers out there uh, with 1,000 amps or 2,000 amp type products and, and it's just uh, amazing what's being done in the electronics industry today. What we find, one of those, those things that's happening and it's happening fast in the power integrity world, we've talked a lot about um, target impedance and looking at, at power delivery in the impedance domain. But I think one of the things that's happening fairly rapidly right now is this interest within the industry to go between frequency and time domain. So doing uh, design and simulation in the frequency domain to optimize the impedance going uh, from your source of power, your, your uh, voltage regulator module, your power supply, to your decoupling capacitors, to your load, and you have to look at the impedance matching there and, and what does the whole system look like uh, in terms of, of the impedance versus frequency. But then taking that optimized PDN impedance and exciting it with a time domain signal and actually looking at what is the voltage ripple on that power rail with that impedance design. And so being able to go back and forth between impedance and frequency and uh, realizing that impedance domain is almost kind of like TDR in, in the uh, signal integrity world. We can use it to, um, as Eric, Eric Bogan will say, hack the back, uh, you know, hack the um, transmission line or figure out where the discontinuities are, where the problems are. Well, TDR is used in this SI world to look at, at spatially what's going on uh, in your transmission line delivery of your high-speed signal. In the power world, if we look at impedance versus frequency, um, the low frequency is where your power supply is operating. The mid-range frequencies are where the decoupling capacitors are operating. And the high frequencies, it's your package die uh, capacitance. And so you can start to look at what part of your power delivery is having problems because the impedance versus frequency helps you sort of debug a little bit. Where in the time domain, a lot of times it's much harder to see what part of the system is having trouble. So if you're going to be optimizing a power delivery network, uh, I can't say it enough, you really do need to look in the uh, impedance domain. You need to look at what does the impedance look like from uh, low frequency to high frequency. From that DC operation of your power supply, where does the power supply become inductive and, and, and increasing impedance because it can't keep up. Its control loop's not fast enough to deliver a high frequency power. And so that's where your decoupling capacitors have to take over. And essentially that in the impedance domain, you can see exactly what's happening. The, the power supply impedance starts to increase. You need to add uh, capacitors onto your print circuit board to provide that charge delivery at those higher frequencies and to maintain the low impedance. And the same thing is you have to keep adding decoupling capacitors until the capacitance in the package can take over. And that's at a much higher frequency. And so that's provides you some guidelines as to what your decoupling capacitors need to do. And it, it's actually very interesting, um, it's, I call it a misnomer a little bit. Decoupling capacitors, it's really, you're designing a, tr a power supply. So the power supply works at low frequency, but now uh, your printed circuit board designer, your application designer has to say, I'm going to design the power in the mid-range, that's my decoupling capacitors, are the power source for those frequency ranges. And you really see that when you look in the frequency domain. So decoupling capacitors, it sounds easy. You know, I, I just need a capacitor with enough charge storage to cover, you know, a certain range or a certain amount of charge delivery. But what they don't tell you is when you buy a capacitor, you get an inductor for free. And so you buy a capacitor and at lower frequencies, it looks like a capacitor, it's very well behaved. But again, the capacitor has parasitics. And when you get up to a high enough frequency, it actually transitions to an inductor. And they call that sort of the self-resonant frequency where that transition happens. And so um, at that point where it, it changes, you also see the pure resistance. So right as it's changing from a capacitor to an inductor, you also see the, the series resistance that's part of the capacitor. So a capacitor gets, for free, you get an extra uh, series resistance and a series inductance. And the real big problem in the industry is how do I characterize those parasitics and 
part of when you measure a capacitor, you have to mount it on something, you have to fixture it. And that fixturing will have some inductance in it. And that mounting, the, how you do the pads on the printed circuit board, how the VIA topologies uh, make that connection from the power to ground, will have inductance. We call that mounting inductance or fixture inductance. Well, when the uh, industry measures that capacitor, they don't always tell you how much of that mounting inductance is still left in their vendor data. And uh, if you're doing a simple spice simulation with lumped models and you don't have any printed circuit board parasitics, then you want some of that mounting inductance in your simulation because it's, it's more realistic. But when you nowadays, we have so many simulators, so many options for uh, simulating a printed circuit board with the uh, parasitics that are there using an EM simulator for the printed circuit board model. But that EM model includes the mounting inductance. It has the pads for the capacitor. It has the via topology and the power ground uh, uh, spacing and stuff. So you already are calculating that mounting inductance. And the problem is the vendor model often includes it and you don't want to double count. And so now what you find is we were talking about we need to uh, design that power delivery over a bandwidth with our decoupling capacitors. And um, the large caps will have a lot of inductance. So then I need a smaller cap with lower inductance. And so you keep going smaller and smaller capacitors to get charge storage out to a higher and higher frequency with less inductance. But if my model doesn't have the right inductance, then it's very hard to design, um, you know, to optimize uh, your design for a certain impedance. So if I grab a model and I'm double counting the inductance, then I'm going to be over designing. I'm going to be adding a lot more capacitors than I need to, to try to bring the inductance down. And so that's, that's the biggest challenge is getting accurate models of those capacitors we're using with an EM model. One of the, so this gets to um, a little bit of, of how do I know how to select a capacitor. And um, uh, Steve Sandler actually, it's, it's very simple. It's a real uh, quick rule of thumb. And he came up with the idea that, well, if I'm, it's kind of transmission line theory uh, in the sense that I'm doing impedance matching. And if I uh, uh, have an inductance in my design, it's, it's looking inductive, well, then I need to find a capacitor that the inductance is increasing with frequency, my capacitor decreases with frequency in terms of impedance. And what you find is if you select an L and a C, um, they will balance each other out and create a, sort of a resistive or characteristic impedance. And so that's transmission line theory there. If you have an L and a C, impedance is um, the square root of L over C. So we just take that simple transmission line equation of Z equals square root of L over C. And if I know my inductance that I'm trying to compensate for, say that in active inductance of the power supply or the, the um, ESL inductance of a capacitor, I take that L divided by the target impedance squared and it's the, it gives me a capacitance value. So it's a pretty simple equation and it, it does actually work quite well. So everybody wants lower cost. Everyone uh, wants to use the high volume manufacturing processes and materials because they uh, are easier to get, they're lower cost and um, you know readily available. But I think the biggest problem is it's always a trade-off. Um, I think a lot of people are able to get really good performance by basically just controlling the material properties better, controlling what material they're getting. Um, I used to have customers that would say, oh, I'm using FR4. Yeah, flame flame retardant number four. Well, what, what you know, <laughs> it could be, you know, any of a hundred different vendors. You had very little information on, you know, what were the real characteristics. And sometimes when you pay for a higher performance material, what you're actually paying for is the fact that they're controlling their manufacturing process a lot more. Uh, you know, they're making sure that the, the material processes stay within a much more confined, um, you know, the dielectric constant, loss tangents, everything's controlled. Even the thickness, you know, thickness variation in a layer can have a tremendous impact on uh, your transmission line impedance, which then impacts your your um, reflection and, and losses. So. Uh, I, what I would say is, 
you can you know pay for the more expensive materials that do a lot better job of controlling the properties, reducing some of the losses, uh, even controlling surface roughness, fiber weave, and things like that. Um, or if you want to use a less expensive material, you may have to do a little bit of legwork to figure out how can I control some of those material properties uh, and confine it a little bit better, or get work with a manufacturer to say, hey, I want to use that material, but how can I, you know, maybe you know, always get the same fiber weave. You know, anything can become a transmission line and, and send signals. It's how much loss can you withstand. And so Eric Bokenton, you know, it, it depends. It depends on your application and, you know, what uh, repeatability, you know, what risk uh, you, you can tolerate and things like that. But obviously you can do a lot with FR4. Um, I mentioned the fiber weave. Um, that's not necessarily, you know, with FR4, you can, if you can get a flat fiber weave, um, with that material, then then you're going to go a long ways towards you know having a little bit more uniformity. Controlling thickness of your your layers is also a, a big deal. You can also do some tricks. If um, we we used to do it in the RF mic microwave world, and it's one of the reasons why we, a lot of uh, high frequency materials like the lower dielectric constant. It gives you less loss, but it also lets you widen up the traces for the same thickness. So for the same thickness of material, you can have a wider uh, transmission line, which then has lower losses, just even of the resistivity um, uh, characteristics. But the wider trace uh, does help give you lower losses a lot of times. When designing a printed circuit board stack up for high frequencies and for power integrity, I guess the, the one that, that sticks in my head all the time, you always, obviously uh, you have to have power. Your electronics doesn't run without power. And one of the challenges is that the power layers, you typically want to have uh, a thicker copper. Um, you also need to worry about your the symmetry of your printed circuit board so it doesn't potato chip. The, the mechanical stresses don't cause it warping. So the simplest form is to put the power and ground layers in the middle. Um, but what I don't think a lot of people realize is that the, the power and ground layers, if you can get the power and the ground closer together, um, the, the loop inductance is very much smaller. So the spreading inductance uh, is less, which means if my power and ground layers are close together, I can place capacitors further from my load and I still have le a lower uh, inductance in the path. It's what really hurts on the power and ground is, is too much dielectric between the, the power and ground layers. So power and ground goes in the middle uh, and then signals go on the outside. I'm a fan of, of uh, strip line uh, running high speed transmission lines internal to the board because then you, d you have far less radiation problems. Uh, the, the print circuit board manufacturing process is a lot more controllable on that etch for the transmission line la transmission lines. However, you have to get in there. And so via design is always a challenge. And uh, back drilling uh, was a really big uh, uh, advancement in the SI world to get rid of via stubs. Uh, sequential lamination is another way of, of making sure your vias don't have capacitive stubs that can often degrade the high frequency. I think the in SI that's an easy one. Uh, you, it, right now at the high, you know, very high data rates, 56 uh, gigabits NRZ and things like that, they really are starting to see fiber weave impacts, uh, surface roughness of the metal. Uh, there's and, and thickness variations. There's there's all these things that can can impact the uh, losses. With PI, it's probably a little bit more, um, you know, less of an impact. But like I mentioned, uh, some of these crazy designs with, uh, you know, thousand amps and things like that, you start running into some fabrication issues of wanting to get fairly thick metals for the, the uh, thermal issues and the current densities. But you also need the very thin layers to keep that uh, path inductance, the parasitic inductance of the print circuit board path and the power delivery way down. And so um, I, I hear some manufacturers looking at sub, you know, less than one mil, you know, micron level thicknesses. And in that, that fabrication process is not going to be easy. When modeling signal integrity and power integrity, I can, the, the, the key is e, the EM simulators. The, um, 
the data rates and uh, for signal integrity and the uh, uh, like I mentioned the lower power rails with higher currents the margins are much smaller we're very sensitive to the print circuit board parasitics for power integrity and so both in the SI world and the PI world we're becoming very dependent upon the EM model um, to create sort of a digital twin of that printed circuit board. And the simulators are getting quite adept at being able to bring in that printed circuit board multi-layer CAD data with the stack up information <clears throat> and create the 3D model. And with net-based information of, of the components, pins, and the nets, you can very quickly be up and running with ports on your, your EM model and looking at transmission lines or power delivery networks. So accurate simulations uh, are, are wonderful because they can predict behavior. They can also, uh, you know, help you do what ifs. So in in the engineering world, we used to, you know, you you build a hundred boards with with a hundred different little variations to try to figure out which one was going to be the best one. Well, that's expensive and it takes a lot of uh, time to get results and the measurements. In the simulator. Um, you know, I can do a hundred experiments, I just sweep the variable and out comes the output. So uh, simulation can do a lot of pre-layout, predictive type behavior. But there's also some really um, interesting things going on where measurement can't, there's certain measurements you can't do. Uh, looking for dynamic current in, in the power integrity world, if I want to know the dynamic current going into a multi-pin FPGA or VGA device, there's, you know, 20 or 30 or 50 different uh, power pins and to try to figure out what the total current is and the dynamic behavior of that is very difficult with measurement. Um, but there are some nice techniques where I can do voltage measurements across my, my power delivery network, my impedance black box. Then I create that same model in my simulator, put my measured voltages across it, and I can get the dynamic current, which I couldn't measure. So it's, it's um, learning some of these very, uh, using a digital t twin, as I would call it, and combining that with some measurements to do things that you can't do in measurement and you can't do in simulation. So I think that's going to be a really fascinating area going forward uh, for the simulation world. So one of the things that, that Keysight has been being, has, or I should say, Keysight is doing very well right now uh, a, a couple of years ago, we came out with uh, these Pathwave EM tools called SI Pro and PI Pro, and they're focused on the needs of a high-speed digital designer with designing a printed circuit board. And what they've done, I think it's helping change the industry, is really making it easier for someone who's not a PhD on electromagnetic theory to actually import a board, you know, select the, the two components that they want to you know simulate the transmission line or the interconnect between and having all the port setups done automatically um, it knows that you're doing a printed circuit board so there's a lot of optimization and boundary conditions and setups that are done automatically uh, so really enabling a lot more people to do EM uh, simulation and being a, making it easier making it more intuitive uh, it really speeds up the learning process of the engineering community because now, you know, putting EM simulation at the fingertips of everybody, uh, that learning curve just speeds up on, on the technology they can create, uh, the innovation that you're seeing out there in um, the Internet of Things, the auto, uh, autonomous vehicles uh, with all the camera systems and sensors. There's a tremendous amount of creativity as the density of electronics is bringing all of this different technology together. Keysight uh, has focused for power integrity and signal integrity. Uh, our flagship product is, is Keysight uh, Pathwave ADS. We've had this ADS advanced design system simulator for quite a few years. It was originally developed for the RF microwave world, but as we all know, um, signal integrity is well past, you know, we're well into the microwave world of, of signal transmission. And even power integrity is not a DC problem, it's AC. Um, you're, you're looking at, at the impedance versus frequency and things like that. So this ADS tool is, has been an excellent environment that lets you do uh, pre-layout schematic simulations, uh, post-layout, you have a layout tool in there, you can look at the layout design and modify things. Um, and then like I mentioned, the, the real um, benefit that has happened in the past few years is bringing the EM simulators into an environment like PI Pro and SI Pro integrated with ADS so it's very easy to take that layout, 
um, that you've imported, go into an EM tool, create the uh, EM model of that printed circuit board with all the components attached, and then that EM simulator exports it back out to ADS schematic. And so I can do post layout, uh, what if simulations change component values, uh, look at what the impact is, and then that sort of digital twin can also help with debugging. So once you start getting measured data, you can start feeding that back into your simulation models and increase the fidelity and, and start troubleshooting. So, you know, Pathwave is one of our new sort of um, branding uh, names that we've given it. And it's actually very exciting because we're really looking at, like we were talking about, the end-to-end -end, uh, design flow for a hardware engineer, starting from the concept pre-layout, uh, going through post-layout of a print circuit board, electronic design, to actual uh, hardware uh, fabrication and, and you know, testing with instruments and looking at what that that design cycle loop really looks like. And I think the exciting thing with Keysight is that we are known for you know top of the line uh, RF microwave instruments, uh, our scopes, uh, amazing uh, capability. And one of the reasons also for for having that pathway phrase is that if you look at our network analyzers, our oscilloscopes. There is an amazing amount of software, our spectrum analyzers, that's providing uh, sort of advanced data processing and signal processing. And so uh, we're really finding that we want to be merging some of that capability, you know, the data analysis that we have on our instruments and tying that back more in with, with the simulation capabilities. And so uh, it's really becoming a, a little bit more blurred between simulation and measurement and so I think some, some of the new phrases you're hearing are digital twins where the the simulation model is kind of merging with the measurements and you're starting to get some some uh, advancement in how you do designs and troubleshooting and, and uh, predicting behavior.